campaigns to take action in the climate sector in a more considered way. Um, just to briefly introduce myself, I was the uh, founder and uh, CEO of Sensible Object, a, a mixed reality gaming company. Um, in 2019, we sold that company to Niantic and I more recently served as their head of London studio. Um, I left about six months ago to try to answer the question, um, how can I apply my skills uh, and experience to address challenges in the climate space? Uh, so I, um, like many people, I'm working out how to apply my skills in new contexts. And um, I think it's really important when we consider uh, what's going on in the world, we, we think of it not only as a series of challenges, but also an opportunity space. Behaviors and technologies are changing and evolving at a very rapid pace. And that creates uh, opportunity, optimism, ways that we might be able to take action. And so um, while many of the things we need to do are about adapting existing behaviors, um, our conversation today is um, a goal. Our goal is to illuminate what might be an emerging space of new kinds of opportunity or new kinds of action that we might take. Uh, and the way we're going to do that is to bring together three very brilliant people with three very different perspectives. Um, I'll let them introduce themselves in turn as we go through the panel, but we have a storied entrepreneur and studio founder who is taking direct action on climate. We have an environmental engineer uh, who has turned brilliantly to game design as a tool for creating behavior change. And we have a civil servant who is helping to shape the future of our countryside. So they're describing very different perspectives on this new territory. And my hope is that by bringing these amazing people together, we can have a really interesting and fruitful discussion about ways uh, that we might uh, be able to take action and move forward. So thank you very much, uh, Christian, uh, Katie and Rohan for joining us. And we're gonna begin um, with a conversation with uh, Christian Segestrada. So Christian, would you like to uh, introduce yourself uh, to the summit? I would. Thank you for that very, very generous intro. I don't know about story, but I'm sure about the entrepreneur bit. So I've spent the last 20 years, literally since July of 2001, when I founded my very first game company then called Macrospace, today called Blue Mobile. I suppose EA, really. Um, literally for 20 years, I've done nothing but build computer games companies. And like my mom is still waiting for me to get a real job. So there's that. But throughout these 20 years, they were building first Macrospace, which early on merged with a company called Sorin to form Glue Mobile. Um, and then after that, a company called Playfish, which is based out of London. And after that, as an investor in various companies like Supercell, I then also, um, uh, also uh, joined my current company, Super Mega Megacorp, where I'm today the chief exec. And uh, and we focus on building sort of next generation cross-platform multiplayer games. But so I've been doing this for 20 years and, I, and a few years back for me, I started thinking, hey, how do I give back? So this thing has been sort of on my mind also, as I'm sure is frankly on the minds of many, many, many folks in the game industry. Awesome. Yes. And um, uh, you've taken that step, which is the most exciting thing, and actually put some of those thoughts into action. Um, recently, you initiated a project called the Climate Founders Pledge. Um, I wonder if you could just share a bit about that project, um, what you set out to do, and, and how the project went. Yeah, so <clears throat> a few years back, I decided, in fact, when I turned 40, I felt like that was kind of a, a moment when I really should be growing up. That moment that my mom has been waiting for all of these you know, years should finally come to, you know, come to pass. And I did start thinking about, okay, so how do I spend like the second half of my career, not just hopefully building several additional uh, successful game companies, but also actually figuring out how I can contribute to making the world a better place for my kids. And based on a whole bunch of research, lots of really great philanthropic organizations that were incredibly helpful. So folks like Longview Philanthropy and uh, Open Philanthropy and 80,000 Hours, all of these types of organizations. Through all of that research, I ended up down a path where I decided I'm going to do one project every year of some kind of impact nature, whether it's commercial or charitable. And I'm going to sort of pour everything I know into it. And then I'm going to see what I can learn from it and then try to do better next year. So for me, like one of the primary lessons from entrepreneurship has been whenever you try to do something new, you're going to fail more times than you believe. So 
taking an approach where I don't directly jump into something new and believe I know what I'm doing, but rather try something, see what comes out, learn and do it better next time has been a really important sort of guiding principle for me. And I'm, I'm approaching impact in the same way. So last year, I actually did a project in biosecurity um, around setting up a, what I thought was going to be a not a non for uh, how what's it called a, a non-profit around testing and then with COVID, but then hopefully in the future, creating like community-led protocol that actually ended up becoming a commercial venture called uh, Primary Health, which I'm now an investor in. But um, this year, what I decided to do early in the year was sort of from this feeling of that this is a really pivotal year for climate, like this is where this year so many things are going to be like done or not done in terms of deciding how we build back from the from the COVID issues. So I decided I'm going to focus this year entirely on climate. And I decided to focus on the nonprofit side of climate specifically, because it feels more neglected. I'm very much a believer in the sort of effective altruism way of thinking about the world of finding causes, which are big, which are tractable, and which um, <clears throat> which are neglected, which other people don't aren't spend enough time on. So decided on nonprofit, specifically within climate change, decided to focus on extreme climate change. There's perhaps five to 10% chance that the earth might warm as much as six degrees. And that would be really, really terrible. So what can we do to prevent that? Well, one is continued race to zero, in particular on the policy side, making sure the policy framework is there for private companies to build clean tech, but then also to actually invest in the basic research and understanding of the upper atmosphere, marine cloud brightening, other things that could make the planet a little bit brighter in case you know, if the bad thing happens and it turns out in 20 years, we actually find ourselves in a really bad spot. How do we make sure that we can buy ourselves 20, 30, 40 more years to win that race to zero in such a way and without like making the planet uninhabitable in the process? So I raised, um, I got together with a bunch of game founders, game company founders, Mikko Korisoya, who was a co-founder of Supercell, um, as well as Jussi Lakon, who was a co-founder of um, of um, uh, amplifier, which became part of Unity, and then uh, Kevin Chow, who was a co-founder of Kabam. We all got together. We decided to put a half a million dollar pledge together of we're going to be matching, if you like, every donation made by other people in the game industry. Reached out to a lot of folks, ultimately ended up raising uh, just over $1.3 million, out of which 80% went to Founders Pledge uh, Climate Fund, which is a really great fund. If you haven't looked at it, you should look at it. They're incredibly good at very sharply deploying capital into places where it's going to nudge policy into the right place at the right time. And then 20% into a company called, or into an organization called Silver Lining, Don NGO, who are focused on a DARPA-like model to basically investigate and fund uh, research, basic research into atmos upper atmosphere modeling, into various ways in which we might be able to reflect more solar uh, out back into space and become cooler that way in case should it come to pass it's very much a last you know option that nobody wants to deploy but we should be ready in case bad things happen as an entrepreneur and i'm sure as many many other people in the audience who've been building games know things that can go wrong usually do go wrong at some point in time so being ready for that situation always having a plan b and a plan c i think is incredibly important so that's that's uh, that's what that campaign was about that's so awesome. Um, so just a couple of questions about that campaign. Um, as you took this campaign out to your network, to other founders and leaders in the games industry, um, what was the reaction like? Were you uh, largely pleased by the reaction? Um, was it uh, a split in terms of people's response? Like how, how, how did it come across as you started to take out this campaign and the fundraising effort? Yeah, it was really interesting. I didn't know what to expect. Truthfully, like my own objective here was that I think this is a year, an important year for climate. I am going to kind of use my own charitable budget. I mean, somewhat fortunate in the outcomes of some of the companies that I've been involved in. So I decided to pledge a kind of a quarter of a million dollars myself on $250,000 toward climate this year. And I thought, what can I do to like make the most out of it in terms of get the most leverage from this? Can I somehow like multiply that number one way or the other? And can I make as much noise about it as possible to spread the if you like spread the uh, um, the word, not just about climate change because that you can't really escape it, but rather about the chance for extreme climate change and hence the level of urgency that there truly is in like, in getting on this like now, now. Um, so I was very, very pleased with just how many game company founders are really passionate about this subject. We ended up with um, like not only those folks who initially kind of contributed to creating that half a million dollar matching pledge, but then uh, something like 17 or 18 people who put down major donations in the tens of thousands of dollars in order to ultimately reach that 1.4 $1 million goal. And, and even the folks who 
chose not to participate actually i was incredibly like impressed with the level of thoughtfulness around charity like so for some folks they said look i don't view climate as being the the most neglected cause right now i am focusing my own charitable uh, giving on you know something different which i'm more passionate about which is re really fine um the main mm -hmm. thing i was really passionate about at the start of this campaign was that we've had a great year a great set of years frankly as a game industry and the rest of the planet haven't necessarily had such a great year so it's kind of on us to do a thing and it'd be great to be able to not just hopefully get some money together but rather uh build a a sense of um I guess, momentum and movement within the industry that, hey, we really should be doing something. And the vast majority of folks that I ended up talking to were incredibly positive and, and, um, and were either already doing something or joined, the, uh, joined this particular campaign. So I was, I was incredibly pleased. I had set myself the goal of, a, like when I announced the campaign, I think, you know, when I announced like a big, ambitious goal of a million dollars, like, can I get there, right? And getting mm. to 1.3, 1. 1. nearly, nearly 1.4 was really cool. That's amazing. So, um, I just want to that's a so moving on from this specific campaign and just thinking a bit more about your perspective as an as an entrepreneur and an investor um i think it's a uh, it's striking that your first uh, project was uh, a social impact venture that then became commercialized in that first field of you know pandemic response and then the second is you're donating to to other organizations um are there any areas where you are looking to invest um, right now in the climate space where you see a role for teams with gaming expertise? Are there any kind of overlaps between your investing thesis around game teams and your investing thesis around climate impact? You know, I'm trying to figure this out, to be honest. I am kind of a noob when it comes to climate tech overall. So part of why I'm enjoying events like this is frankly to, to learn more about it. For me, they are like they are. Uh, <clears throat> it's incredibly important that both the nonprofit sector that impacts policy and basic research gets kind of looked after one way or the other. Where I think us in gaming can have a really beneficial impact simply by donating and being being part of it, because there's no yeah. business model in policy. There is no business model in uh, in basic research. But where there is a business model, and I think ultimately a venture that scales commercially, like commercial, if you like, profitability is the best source of funding for anything, as all of us in the game industry know, right? You don't want to rely on investors or some grants from somewhere to make games. You want to be able to make a product that ultimately funds itself. So I'm very, very bullish on green tech of all kinds, from carbon capture to clean energy uh, across the board. Right now, given the policy environment out there and given the zeitgeist of the world, so I do think there's a lot of commercial ventures that will be quite successful. And I spend a fair bit of time trying to figure out which, say, venture funds to invest in in order to make sure that as much capital gets funneled into those companies as possible. I also, though, do think that the game industry is at the forefront of many things, including data science, including um, behavioral science, including figuring out how to create interesting engagement loops. And I do think that the talent, getting more of that talent involved, both in shaping public policy, but also shaping some of these ventures that are being built in climate tech that has a sort of a consumer impact, if you like, be that in clean energy or be that in some other form of collective collective action. I think it's all it's all really, really useful. I actually, I'm always really inspired by 80,000 hours as a resource showing just how many climate jobs, if you like, impact jobs there are out there. And I think that the game industry and people in the game industry have an awful lot to contribute. So I'm excited about the game industry, both contributing in terms of making itself clean, like cleaning up its own backyard in terms of being, being carbon neutral or carbon negative. Um, I'm excited about the money that we can raise for nonprofits. And I'm also ex very excited about the money that we might be able to invest in clean tech and the talent that we hopefully can contribute uh, to the broader clean tech movement across the board. I think the next 10 years will be an incredibly exciting time in that area commercially, as well as from a nonprofit perspective. And that's why I'm so excited about it. That's awesome. Um, so one final question um, for this section, and that's um, as an investor, are you considering as you look at your portfolio, the carbon impacts of, of your investments? Um, so, for example, you know, NFT and blockchain powered gaming startups are quite hot in the sector right now. There's quite a lot of investment being funneled into those. We uh, there's a lot of data that says that, you know, blockchain and NFTs are going to are generate, you know, 
consuming a huge amount of energy in the way that they do proof of work and those sorts of things. So is there, you know, is, is that part of the conversation in the kind of investor conversations that you're having? So for me personally, like I, I view that stuff as being really important. I do. I have a very mixed relationship with crypto as a result. On the one hand, like you cannot but be excited and inspired by the idea of decentralized things in general. Why should a central organization control a thing like Facebook or Twitter or, you know, or a game for that matter? Why couldn't you build a thing where it is foundationally distributed, foundationally kind of federated both in its governance and in the economic structure, and then to basically just have a tax on every transaction that feeds the federation in such a way that the whole thing can grow autonomy. I just think it's amazing. Like it's an amazing idea. We're obviously at the very, very early stages of that and who knows where it will land. But I do, I'm very concerned about I guess Bitcoin and Ethereum in particular as just the amount, I think I saw somewhere that crypto is consuming like 0.8% or something similar of the entire world's power up today, which is like, which is terrifying kind of. Um, but I do think that there are other a layer one chains. There are other technologies that are coming on board where it doesn't meet decentralization or sort of web three, quote unquote, doesn't mean necessarily a massive carbon footprint, even though it does, there is a large intersection of those two things, but it doesn't have to be that. So it's definitely a consideration for me and it's something that I think a lot about. Like, I do want to make sure that the you know, talk is at the end of the day, just talk. I do want to, you know, walk the walk in all of these areas. I'm very passionate about it. I want to be able to tell my kids I did my absolute best in this regard. And I've been fortunate that some good things have come my way. And I want to make sure that I kind of pay it forward and make sure that the next generation has it better than I did, or at least that we don't like mess it up for them because that'd be just terrible. Quite right. Thank you so much, Christian. So we'll rejoin uh, you in a little while when we come back to the whole panel. But for now, I'd like to um, uh, introduce Katie Patrick. Um, so Katie, if you can uh, join me in the little boxes. There we are. Hi. Um, so yeah, thank you so much for being on the panel today. Um, I just read your book, uh, well, listened to it actually, and, and found it really inspiring. Um, would you like to just uh, yeah tell the summit a little bit about yourself? Sure, yeah, and um, thank you for um, listening to the audio book and for, for having me here. So I come from a bit of a different background in the context of a game design audience in that I'm an environmental engineer and primarily I'm a, a technical sustainability person. You know, air pollution, kilowatt hours of green buildings, water pollution. That's the background that I come from. Um, but I was a bit different to the other environmental engineers is that I grew up in a creative family. So I was kind of a bit of an artist as well as an environmental engineer. And I was a little bit too creative to really fit in the box of, of normal engineering. And uh, that, um, so in my, my journey of really wanting to make a sustainable world happen, I ended up being drawn to content. So trying to tell the environmental story, which is, over, an overarching theme that I discovered that's going on with environmental change, which is saying that we have to educate people about the environment. We have to get people to care. And we tend to all be in this worldview that we need to get people to educate, we need to get them to care. But this thing is called the value action gap. And most of us has fallen into this trap. I realized this, I had this enormous sort of epiphany after spending um, a large amount of my career building startups and um, actually had quite a successful startup in, in Australia that turned over a few million dollars, had a magazine in the kind of the early stages of the of the internet and a website portal about, you know, green, green everything. Um, that we really needed to approach things as a behavior or an action designer, which led me to looking up game design textbooks. I discovered Jesse Shell, some people would be familiar with his book, The Art of Game Design, and other game design textbooks. And I started looking at games for this framework of how to actually be an action or a behavior designer. And this was an enormous epiphany for me about how I could marry this type of uh, creativity and this type of worldview with the type of in technical environmental sustainability work and all bring it around the feedback loop of data. And so I kind of, I call it Fitbit for the planet design, not necessarily like game design or gamification design, but really trying to get that, that idea through that we need to see our environmental footprint the same way that you, a Fitbit would show you your health indicators for your own individual footprint, but also for your community and your neighborhood and your state kind of nesting these data models together. And so I ended up writing a book on this style of design, really bringing these, these almost like a cybernetic earth feedback loop of data of the planet as the core um, points or the poor, core progress mechanism of a game design experience, which is endlessly fascinating. 
Um, so I wrote this book, How to Save the World, about that. I also have a podcast where I uh, interview academic authors, PhDs, people who have studied environmental psychology and test these kind of theories out in the academic method to really kind of like drive into the theory of what drives environmental change. And I work on a number of different projects with um, in NASA, uh, Google, the United Nations. I'm trying to figure out how do we really weave in game design principles and behavior design principles into all of these um, these big issues that uh, they work on. Um, I mean, I could keep going about all of the all of the different projects, but maybe that's enough um, right now to answer the question. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, thank you so much for that brilliant intro. Um, I actually wanted to start by just actually. You titled your book, How to Save the World. And I love that because actually optimism, ambition and determination, it can, it, it can be uh, feelings in short supply right now. You know, it's, e it's easy to feel overwhelmed by the, the news and the data. So I wanted to talk about what motivates, what motivates you to do the work you do and, and what's giving you optimism right now in, in your work. Oh, well, this is one of my favorite topics to talk about. I mean, where do I where do I start? I mean, I've been obsessed and in love with the technical craft and the science of sustainability. You know, since I, I was a little girl, like I loved nature. I used to draw flowers. I wanted to become a botanist, and then I started to study, you know, um, you know, photo, how you get photovoltaic, weight, how you build wind turbines, how do you get green roofs to work? I mean, as a scientist or an engineer or a hacker or a tinkerer, I'm sure a lot of people who are in the video games scene would kind of resonate with wanting to, you know, solder electronics together and work on an Arduino and try to make things like that kind of like real like hacker maker instinct. When you when your forum, when your when your tools and your chessboard that you're working on is all of these different environmental mechanics and you take the time to really understand how they put together. I mean, this is the most fascinating, wonderful um, sandbox in which to immerse yourself. And it just never gets more interesting. I mean, just imagine being able to redesign an entire civilization to work in harmony with the planet where we have all of our technology as a wonderful, fascinating, advanced technology that was built. And it's incredibly, rich and beautiful ecosystem that is our planet. I mean, we're on the precipice of being able to meld these two things together to work in harmony as this next chapter of civilization. I mean, that is the ultimate scientific and technical um, and ecological quest. I mean, for me, this is way more exciting than going to the moon or going to Mars. I mean, we have these big um, these big scientific journeys that we go through as a civilization, like for example, the moon landing. It's one that I use a lot as an example. That was an enormously exciting moment for humanity. And I feel like the next one, or what I call is like the real singularity, is where technology and the, and the Earth's ecosystem will actually come together in harmony. And that's something that humanity has never achieved. Even tribal civilizations often destroyed their environment, even if they didn't have advanced technology. And this is the this is the quest of our generation to try and solve this, and it's full of so many fascinating problems. And so, just technically, it is just so fascinating and wonderful to understand. But the overarching vision, and this is something that I talk about in my TED talk. I've just launched something called the Imagine Project, which is trying to trying to hatch open the the imagination of people, is to imagine what this utopian sustainable sustainable civilization would look like? I mean, would we have biophilic cities with cascading vegetation coming off buildings? Would we have an entire earth that's solar, that's solar powered, a, a, an age where the oceans are clean and when plastic is not littering the ocean anymore? You know, we wouldn't have cars dominating, dominating cities. Cities could be beautiful, ecologically rich and safe, creative, places i mean to really hatch open our imagination for what this beautiful future world could be i mean that's what really that's where my head is at all of the time i mean i was a little bit like greta thunberg when i was a teenager when i was 16 i felt the way she felt sort of in this sense of doom and crisis but over the years of doing this i mean it's just so exciting the idea of being able to build this world i'm really investing a lot of my time and my you know my day-to-day -day effort into trying to better illustrate both with words, with visions, with uh, story design, this type of vision of what this future world um, will be. So anyway, I'll stop, I'll stop going That's on about it. No, well, I can understand why you want to talk about it. It's thrilling. Um, so 
Uh, something I want to really recommend uh, for panel for, for people at the summit is um, katiepatrick.com has a number of concrete projects uh, listed out there. It's, it's, there's some really interesting examples of this work as well as uh, which I which I which I really enjoyed exploring. I was wondering, you know, like if we could take one of those projects, the Urban Canopy Project that I think you worked on with NASA's uh, Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Um, it seemed to me really exciting that there was now these live data sets that you could work with to start to generate this behavior change. And that was one of the key uh, things that I took away from, from your work and the book. As a game designer, we're used to working with live data and you know we're, we're seeing a lot of data, but it's from a fairly constrained environment, which is an individual's act, interaction with a digital device. And my understanding of the way you're working as a, as a designer, an environmental engineer, is the data is flowing from sensors, from satellite imagery, from all of these different places that it enables a similar kind of real-time insight into action and interaction, and therefore being able to influence those things. Do you think, is that, is that right? Do I have a good characterization of, of how that space is emerging? Uh, yeah, I mean, that is the dream. That, that That's the goal. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have as much real-time data as we would like. I mean, ideally, you want all of the environmental data. And I'm talking about, say, the carbon from kilowatt hours, the amount of natural gas we have, the amount of petroleum that cars are using, the air pollution in every single city, the quality of water that is in lakes and rivers, the amount of water that your house is consuming. Um, the surface temperature, like you said, with the urban heat island one that I was doing doing with NASA, that's how hot cities get, you know, different locations get in, in, in summer. So there are so many different of these environmental metrics to work with. Uh, but what we really want to do is have them in, in real time. So, it's, for example, air pollution is a good example where this can be done reasonably easily. Like, why can't we go out on the street and see a small display, for example, on a bus shelter that shows you the real time air pollution? And instead of having it designed in a really ugly way, which always happens when engineers do it, it's actually designed quite beautifully, like how you would expect Apple to do it. And it's it's genuinely sort of impactful and it has a real call to action. It, it could be policy trying to affect government or it could be an individual behavior like trying to encourage people to walk more or, or, or get in, get an EV. You could have that sensor on a bus station showing that screen there in real time as well as on an app and as well as, as on devices. I mean, that's one example. But so we want the data in real time. Sometimes we can get it. A lot of the times we can't, depending on what it is. But we also one of the key things that I'm always trying to drive home is that we really need this data to be geographically granular as well in terms of by land parcel. Because one thing game designers would understand is that when you compare people to each other, it's enormously powerful. It's shown in the behavioral psychology literature over and over again. Honestly, like I read all these papers and nothing works as well as saying that you're doing 30% worse than somebody else. It's just enormously powerful to drive people to, to act. So when you can say that it could be like a school campus, like this university is doing worse than that, this business is doing worse than that, a hospital to a hospital, a house to a house, an office to an office. When you can get this comparison, you basically just like hack right in. It's like you crack open the egg of people's motivation. And I've done a lot of testing on this and it really does work. Like I, I do qualitative testing with people and they look at the chart and they're just like, really? Like I'm doing like 20% worse than them. And then they just freak out. And then they're like, oh my God, what do I do? Like, what do I have to turn off? Like, what do I... Like, it's really, really powerful. And so we don't always have access to this level of property by property uh, data. So sort of us who are in the field of change, I'm really trying to like sort of hammer, hammer that home. In particular with the urban heat island one, um, I became really, I mean, I used to be a green building engineer, so I know that um, electricity use really spikes in summer in, in, in any place that has like a hot summer because everybody turns on their air conditioners. Air conditioners use an enormous amount of kilowatt hours, like 3,000 to 5,000 kilowatt hours, the amount of maybe turning on like two or three ovens. Um, so you get this really big spike, especially in California where we have really hot summers. So I was thinking about, you know, how can we use data to encourage people to you know, cool the properties? Um, and use less air conditioning. And I thought, you know, wouldn't it be fun to use thermal photography? Like we can show that in, in, and encourage like green walls and green roofs and people to plant trees and use shade vines. It sounds like a really fun kind of um, uh, data source to work with because it's colorful and you can see the red and, and the orange and, and green and everything. And so I started looking into like, how can we get a property, a score per property and the existing satellite imagery was, uh, it was too broad. It was like one pixel is one kilometer. 
so I mean, what can you do when a pixel is a kilometer wide, right? You cannot show people that individual comparison. And the problem is that when we're working, the industries that I work in, everybody is really a scientist or an engineer. They're not thinking as a behavior designer. So they think, well, one, you know, one temperature score per kilometer is fine. We get a sense of a city. I'm like, yeah, but if you ultimately want to drive individual action, you need to get these granular data so you can show people the comparison. And that drives change. And this is kind of like a mind blown moment for the engineers and scientists. They're like, whoa, we never thought of this. You know, it shows how different the lens of game design and behavior design is to the lens at which engineers and scientists view, view the problem. Um, but then I discovered that NASA had this new sensor on the on the space station. I just was sort of like Googling and having lots of phone calls and eventually discovered their team. And they are, uh, and so I was like, oh, this problem, I was like, listen, the satellite imagery is like so coarse, like we cannot get it at any kind of granularity. And they'd been working on actually this really novel type of machine learning approach where they brought um, three types of satellite imagery together, which is this one long wave thermal sensor combined with Landsat 8 um, data, which is the um, looking at the amount of vegetation cover because satellites can pick up on chlorophyll in plants and also albedo, which is how dark or how light something is. And our uh, Christian referred to, you know, reflecting light from the planet. I mean, we have all these surfaces that are dark. We really need to start lightening the surfaces of roads and roofs, et cetera. So that's what that can. And then you can apply a machine learning algorithm that chops up the pixels and then gets a greater level of granularity. And so anyway, I just discovered this by calling them and working with them sort of on my own journey of, of curiosity. And it's great. Like it, it's we now are working with this new sense of granular data, making these beautiful maps, being able to have a pop-up window that shows the comparison, all of the things. And it's not that hard to do. This is what I'm trying to say to like the game design community is that a lot of this stuff is just ripe for the taking. Like you can just make a few phone calls, you can put it together, you can figure it out and you can make these huge leaps forward in terms of like the data and the action design, like because the existing industry is not thinking this way. So there is just so much opportunity, so much low hanging fruit to try and invest these more creative approaches to doing it. Like this one that I discovered with NASA. Um, so it's a really exciting Amazing. project. I mean, the next step is to just try and figure out, um, you know, how we fund it. Fantastic. Well, we can we can come to that a little later. But thank you so much, Katie. Um, that was, I mean, I genuinely think it's a uh, thrilling and so important work. And whenever engineering and creativity get together, that's where tremendous excitement and potential happens. And, and you're absolutely living that. Thank you so much. We'll, we'll see you again in a little while. And if we can uh, invite Rohan to come and join me in the little green box. Rohan, hi, how are you doing? Yeah, good, thanks. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, so this is really, I think, you know, it's leading on from a lot of the uh, discussions that we've had because you're actually wrestling with the the reality of what this is like on the ground, quite literally. Yeah, mm. the, you know, the, the earth and the rivers and the farmland of, of the UK. Um, so do you want to just uh, tell the summit a little bit about yourself and, and what it is you're working on right now? Yeah, I mean, I'm really humbled to be invited to speak with the kind of speakers on this panel today. And uh, I was reflecting, actually, I've been in the civil service for 20 years. And I thought, how have I made a difference over that period of time? And, and how am I going to do it in my current job? And prior to joining the Department for Environment here in the UK, I was a service owner at the Driver and Vehicle Licensing Agency. Um, and I think that's really at odds with what we're talking about because it was about registering cars and, and vehicles and, and getting people driving licenses. But actually, you know, thinking through it, I, what I achieved there probably did make a small difference. Um, so I led the kind of delivery of the digital exemplar program uh, and, and lots of other digital services, eventually running all of the, the online services for the DVLA, driving the digital take up to over 95%. And just to give that some context, that's over a billion digital transactions each year. So no small number there. And, and one of the things that we did uh, in the DVLA is we kind of tried to assign the benefits of digitization to sustainability. And it's one of the first times it's been done in government. And we actually then equated, every time we kind of put something online, what does that mean for reducing paper? So for example, you know, putting the driver license services online, we could reduce paper the height of a hundred Mount Everests 
really impactful mm. way of kind of getting people to buy in. And if you look at every digital transaction, could take away three car journeys or lorry journeys back and forth from DVLA and Swansea back all around the UK. So really impactful way of can describing what you're doing there in digitization. I moved to Department of Environment, as I said, in May 2021. I've taken up this role now of service owner for future farming, and I'm accountable for the quality of the service for our users. But at the heart of it is really a number of schemes which we can hope we can deliver significant environmental benefits towards the, the UK's aim of achieving net zero within the next 25 years. So really exciting stuff that we've moved on to now in, in the Department of Environment. Absolutely. So this is the Future Farming Programme, um, a suite of uh, policy interventions and funding streams and different ways that, that farmers and landowners and land managers uh, can sustainably manage their land so that uh, you might improve water quality or carbon sequestration. Um, so do you want to just speak a bit like what are, if you at a very high level, what are the goals of the Future Farming Programme and what sort of impacts are, d does DEFRA hope that that will have on the countryside and uh, our nature and, uh, and the general public? It's a really unique opportunity. I mean, over the last kind of 40 years, farmers essentially get paid for the amount of land they have and then they can farm that essentially in the way that they see best you know, to, to kind of be pro ultimately be profitable. But under the new system, we can actually pay farmers for realizing outcomes that help the environment. So, you know, really trying to drive environmentally sustainable long term actions that are going to benefit the environment and hopefully make them more productive at the same time. So they'll get paid for doing things like ensuring that the waterways are, are much cleaner, you know, that the air is, is better protected, that we look at how we manage the soil, how we can allow plants and wildlife to thrive by planting hedgerows or by having uh, gaps in between our fields so that we can actually grow wildlife and, and, and the thing that's going to make such a difference in terms of how they manage their land and how they encourage you know the, the improvement of the sustainability of the agriculture and the ecosystem in which they live and that's going to go across a range of different services um, and my role well, basically, I'll be looking to make sure that's a user-centered digital service to allow them to do that. So rather than having to apply on reams of paper, really complex, trying to simplify and make it really easy for them to understand how they can apply for that funding to support them do those things, uh, and then ultimately uh, realize those benefits for the environment. Hmm. Um, so you're a service owner, you're working in this dynamic, digitally centered way with farmers and land managers. And if you, I think the, you know, if you could leverage some of the brightest minds from the games industry, some of the people who are in the room, some of the people who are in our networks and uh, like, if there are key, what are the key challenges that you're facing that you, when you think about the kind of skills and capabilities of folks in the gaming sector and what we've been talking about today, what would you get them to do? Hello, it's a great quest farmer in a valley. Uh, and hello, can you hear me? We lost you for a second, but I think we've got you back. But I think oh, you might sorry. want to just start that answer from the top. Okay, yeah, great question. I mean, we we talked around it before about how we can kind of leverage and, and really bring it to life for for farmers. So, for example, if you're you know a farmer who's kind of in a valley and there's lots of other kind of farm neighbouring farmers, and you're looking at a nature recovery scheme. If one farmer's planting trees, but on the other side of the river, they're using fertilizers and cutting down hedges and ripping up trees, what's the net o impact overall? So if you can kind of generate that, A, competition, but also the spirit of collaboration between different communities, I think that would be, would make such a difference in understanding how, what you're doing, what impact that has overall. But like I said earlier, really bringing it to life. So if you're doing something to you know, return your, your land to nature or changing the way that you, you manage your soil, what impact does that have, not just on you, but on the, the overall kind of local environment and the national and the, and the global environment? So that's the first one I think mm -hmm. that really resonates. The second one I think is, you know, technology is a wonderful thing, but you know, how can we make it easier for people to go about their daily lives? So if you imagine you're a farmer, you've got say a thousand hectares and you need to kind of map out on an app, for example, what your land is, how you're using it. Um, if you're doing one thing in one field compared to another, what's the difference there in terms of the environmental impact? 
but also I think critically, what's providing them with the best return? Now that could be that in farming in it that way, they can be more productive, but also if they farm in that way, how can they then get more money from the government to support them? You know, the, the, the age old profitability of the farm, if we can tie that into actually doing things in a much more environmentally sustainable way, I think we all win from that. Mm. So what I'm what I'm hearing is it's a kind of thinking about the ways that, you know, um, you know, contemporary games are delivered as a service. They're delivered for a massively multiplayer uh, cohort of people uh, with different intentions, goals, reasons for um, doing the things that they're doing. But then within that, able to facilitate these amazing dynamic collaborations that can kind of also evolve and iterate quite rapidly over time. And it sounds a bit to, to Katie's point that there's also a role for automation and sensing and you know the the uh, expression of a lot of data about these these complex environmental systems in ways that enable uh, landowners and, and, and land managers to make those choices either wargaming out different scenarios mm. and seeing you know, what choices should we make over the next 10 or 15 years or in some cases making quite dynamic choices you know season to season about how they're they're actually adapting and, and managing the land that they live on yeah, very much. You know, these are sometimes kind of lifetime choices. You may have been farming in a particular way for decades. So to kind of change the way that you operate isn't something that you take lightly. And, you you know, you need advice and guidance of, of how to do that, but also then understand what the long term benefits are going to be. Uh, and again, mm -hmm. I think kind of bringing that to life for people, I think, would be so important for us if we're kind of driving these things forward, because we've got a real con we're at a tipping point. You know, farmers are going to be taking, we're taking away the kind of basic payments that they've been used to. And they can either choose to kind of intensify and try and produce more, which could lead to kind of more fertilization, um, more you know, unenvironmentally friendly farming practices, or they can choose to go down a sustainable uh, environmental path, which we would obviously be delighted that they choose that's going to be beneficial to them and also the, the wider environment. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Rohan. That was really, really interesting. Okay, if we want to um, bring all of our all of our panelists back in for the full Bohemian Rhapsody. Um, so we've uh, had a great yeah, I, I, I don't know if uh, the tech or not, will, or not. Will, will be live harmonizing, but we can give it a go. Um, <clears throat> I um, you know, like just as somebody who is sort of entrepreneurially exploring this space. I just think it's so thrilling to hear these different perspectives and to realize how much action is possible and how much action is already being taken and to really refactor our game brain, if you like, the way we think about making and creativity, that relationship between massive audiences, that relationship with data and how we apply and the relationship with commercialization and scale and then apply that in these new formats. Um, but I think it's also true that right now, it's not like we can point to many at scale executions of these kinds of ideas, right? This is definitely you know, a tipping point, but one where we've got to try to breathe these kinds of uh, opportunities into existence and, and, and make them really happen. So I think a question I'd like to you know, um, invite everyone to speak to is, you know, what's um, holding us back from richer collaborations across sectors, you know, in your experience, you know, what what are the things that um, might need to happen or that we need to unlock or create the opportunities for so that some of these hybrid uh, projects might be able to start to take root and, 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 and come to life? Um, I'm going to I'm going to pick on you, Christian, to to go first and uh, maybe what's your what's your initial take and then we'll hear from the other panelists. I think, to be honest, I think Katie probably has the absolute best viewpoint on this particular thing, given just all the amazing stuff she's been working on. But I'm actually going to have a controversial point of view on this. I actually think typically collaborations suck because typically they end up creating a lot of constraints around something that should be new, interesting, and sort of imagineering in a new thing. So what, what I've found overall, and this is why I think it's difficult for bigger companies to change, it's difficult for a an existing culture collection of talent that are used to doing things in one way to really kind of bend themselves 
in a different direction as a group to do or support something else. I have seen much more change, a much more radical evolution come about in any industry by talent that are really passionate about a thing, getting together with other talent who are really passionate about a thing, ideally from different industries, getting together and forming a new venture, getting capital for that venture or funding from somewhere, and then going off and doing something great, recruiting all of the, their best, you know, their, their friends who are really good at something, and then off they go. They don't then require the constraints of a collaboration between two companies who commercial, whose commercial interests are two organizations whose overall kind of constitutions and interests are different. I tend to think that collaborations sometimes can, I mean, they can sometimes be great, but a lot of the time they can also hamper the progress of something that could otherwise be amazing if it could truly be independent and, and, and well-funded. Mm -hmm. So I think that independent, uh, I would love to see more independent efforts um and frankly like a lot of the stuff that katie's doing is incredibly um inspiring to me so katie um if the if you could sort of harness some of that talent from the games industry um uh, and and kind of breathe it into to the projects that you're working on what are the what are the what are the kinds of skills that you feel you need to to add into the teams that you're working on? You know, what are the ways? You know, if there are people out there in the audience today who are like, "Oh yeah, I'd like, to, I'd like to, I'd like to volunteer some of my time, or I'd like to jump in and get involved." What are some of the things that you're you're seeing the need for in your in your space? Oh, um, yeah, and thank you for all the kind words, um, Christian. Uh, it's very nice. Um, very nice to hear my my work be um, be appreciated. And one thing that's really cool is that I'm I mean, everything I do, I'm usually trying to get out to sustainability folk, but often it actually falls on deaf ears because they're not really kind of like open to this very novel way of thinking. But I actually get an enormous amount of love from the game design community, and my biggest fans have actually come from game designers, even though that's really not who I'm usually trying to trying to get out to. Um, so, I mean, there's not one existing entity that's like, here, let's get all of the people who work in game design and let's put them all together with people who work in climate change and sustainability. I mean, that's not sort of currently there as, as a forum. I mean, one thing I do yeah. is I hold a monthly Zoom call that I call Fitbit for the Planet, where I interview people who work in, in, in at the nexus of environmental data and maybe some sort of like game design or augmented reality. I mean, it's the only thing that I've, found just this little um group that i hold for, for my for my podcast um but in terms of like a, a message i could get out to people who are uh game designers i mean i'm not sure if like what christian said if it's gonna work if you try and get like sony to kind of like hook up with like the epa whether that would really go anywhere i mean maybe maybe it would never been done before um but i would actually dig a little bit deeper more sort of emotionally and spiritually deeper into this question i mean in my in my book which is you know primarily sort of a behavior ui ux design manual i devote quite a bit of attention into this idea of one's own personal creative genius zone that that is really the core or the cauldron of where all this stuff comes from and we tend i mean that might be normal for people who work in game design but for people who work in engineering and climate policy telling people to tap into their creative genius zone is a really weird thing and a really unnatural thing to to talk about and so i think the 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 kind of like deeper message is to understand that we all kind of like possess this creative power within us and it is the ultimate driving force of, of innovation and change and good things that come from the world, our, our ability to come up with new ideas, our ability to innovate, not just not just one behavior change, but decade after decade after decade of this deep intelligence that we can grow around a field and, and that we possess this. And this is really our superpower to kind of like tap into this. And then to match this creative power that we have, not trying to like follow an industry or follow a different formula. Like you don't need to just make another Sony PlayStation game or make another app or just change policy. You can do something that's really innovative and really different that sort of comes from sort of deep within you, your own kind of unique fingerprint. Um, so that's kind of like the more emotional or spiritual kind of dimension, but then try to match that with looking at one specific a data feed about the planet. Like, do you want to help encourage green roofs and green walls? That's something I'm working on. Where is the data about it? You can get satellite imagery. You can figure out where trees are and where green walls are looking through satellite or flyover imagery. You can calculate that reasonably easy with some sort of fun image processing tech. Um, you know, how do you, and so you've got sort of like that 
that data feed and then you sort of look at it and then look at all of your game design skills. Like how do we manage progress? How do we use rewards? How do we just use groups and um, groups coming together and community? And, and how do we use like story and onboarding and goals? And how do we use individual characters? And how can a character's expression smiles when the data is good and it frowns when the data is, um, is bad? This is this new thing that's coming out in the research that really hasn't been tapped into is how can you make actual digital characters in a game like experience that are actually our direct um, data visualization. So it's smiling when the when the when your energy use is down, it's frowning when the energy use is up. That could is totally like untapped space that has the most remarkable effect on people's individual action than anything I've ever mm. seen. But anyway, this is like a side thing, but like just really just sink into that, this relationship between the causal mechanism of the data and then augmenting that with your creative skills. So I always talk about creativity and causality, work out the causal mechanism, lay your creativity over it. And that's probably what Christian says, it's gonna come from individual people. It's gonna come from your individual's personal journey, becoming obsessed and fascinated with this process, not just as one-off project, but as your life's work. Decade after decade after decade, you just get better and better at it. And that's where we really see change coming from, this, this lifelong passion, not so much just little tiny behaviors. Awesome. I mean, yeah, I think, it seems to me that what we need is a is a is a flourishing of new startups and and new uh, companies entering the space, and we need to find ways to illuminate this opportunity so that it becomes a realistic alternative for game founders who are passionate about climate to see that there are ways that they can take that step and that you know uh, there there the are alternative routes to growth and success and and meaning in in what they do um just we're, we're gonna uh need to wrap up very soon so i'm just gonna quickly ask rohan um do you think there's an opportunity for the government to be a, a client of those uh, emerging companies do you think that as uh, is there ways that um as those companies who are going to be experimenting and innovating and getting started, you know, might they be able to turn to the government to to help fund that innovation and experimentation as a as a customer? Yeah, I mean, one of the things that we are doing is we're putting a lot of money and resources into funding research and innovation. So, in partnership with the UK Research and Innovation Fund, there's going to be significant funds available to look at that, and and it really is open to all sectors to really look to see how they can contribute. And, and you could look at it from the kind of real technical stuff in terms of you know, geospatial mapping and how you best manage your land, all the way through to actually the user experience, which I think is often overlooked. You know, if you're trying to drive better outcomes, sometimes the way of doing that is by engaging with people in the simpler user interface. And that's something that you know, the game industry is so good at, is you can pick up most games and you can intuitively play it very quickly. And it's the same then if you're looking to apply for funding or to, to measure your outcomes over a long period of time, you've got to try and do that in a way that engages with the majority of people in a really simple, inter interactive and intuitive way. And I think that's something that we can definitely learn from the, the games industry. And, and yeah, I mean, what I would say is that please do keep an eye out for the things that we're doing. And, and, and as I said, if, without the sales pitch, the, uh, there are there is funding available through the research and innovation uh, awesome. funding. All right, um, we've got one question from the floor for, for Christian, which I think actually wraps us up quite well, which is, you know, are there funds out there right now for startups or indie studios that are looking to develop green games or games that have climate impact in some kind of way and are looking for capital? Do, do, you, do you know if there's anything out there right now that's a kind of impact investor for, for game studios? Uh, there are a few i would though however say that i think the most important thing when building any game is to ensure that you have a business model that ultimately ends up funding the game itself so i was i recently actually met this guy oleg fomenko who has a company called sweatcoin where he's able to somehow build a commercial model around encouraging people to walk so it literally tracks your steps and then gives you free stuff for getting to like ten thousand steps so many days in a row and he's made that into a commercial venture that is perfectly venture fundable from anyone. The truth is these days, anything that looks like it's going to be very profitable and grow and scale will be funded well today from all of the, frankly, more and more people want to get into gaming investments in addition to the normal game investors. Um, 
and almost and of course if he has an impact sort of benefit on top of that that's really amazing and you'll really likely close it very fast and it becomes very very competitive um obviously add crypto to that and then somehow it's like add a zero to the valuation at this moment in time but yeah. on the other hand things which do not have a commercial business model if you haven't been able to prove out retention as a monetization model they are very even impact funds have a very difficult time investing in those things so that's why i would really always look at it through the lens of it is our job as commercial entrepreneurs to find things which fund themselves the minute we do that and we can prove out that hey this is a thing that will fund itself somehow it's going to come money from like you know whether it's advertiser microsoft actors wherever it comes from there's a business model here then every investor out there will be interested yeah and well just to wrap up um i believe i genuinely believe as a founder and as a as a game creator that the um those opportunities exist in abundance at this stage. I think we've heard some really interesting perspectives today. Thank you deeply, uh, everyone. Uh, thank you, Katie. Thank you, Christian. Thank you, Rohan, for um, really helping illuminate this really exciting space. And um, yeah, um, pitch decks incoming, uh, I hope. Uh, thank you so much, everyone. And I'll hand back over to Jordan.